What Bear said was true. The title for today is How Not to Read the Bible. So here are some questions that you might ask yourself if perhaps you weren't reading it correctly, or maybe you were. So why couldn't Jonah trust the ocean? It's because he knew there was something fishy about it. Ah. And let's think, where was Solomon's temple located? So it was on the side of his head, just like everybody else. <laughs> Did you know what excuse that Adam gave to his kids when they asked why they got kicked out of the Garden of Eden and couldn't live there anymore? You might have heard this one before. It's, he said, your mother ate us out of house and home. Oh. <laughs> Finally, do you, do you know where the first baseball game is in the Bible? Did you find it? I, I think some people have seen it, so I'll, I'll read it to you. Uh, it says, in the big inning, Eve stole first, Adam stole second, Cain struck out Abel, and the giants and angels got rained out. All right, now that you're starting to get worried, uh, let me say that I hope that you get a little bit more from today's message than just a few excellent dad jokes. So here are the real takeaways. First, the Bible is not a book. And next, never read a Bible verse. One more time, the Bible is not a book and never read a Bible verse. That's right, I said never read a Bible verse. So before Bear rushes back from Bridge Kids and drags me off the stage here, let's get this sermon started. All right, my name is Andrew. I'm your resident worship pastor or music guy. And uh, when I spoke to you last year about why I worship or truly how and why we all worship, I told you then that the big things that I had learned and shared all came from books that I had been uh, reading with my triad. And today will be no different. All right, so... The book is the same as the title. It's How Not to Read the Bible. And I would highly recommend you read this in your triad or your life group because it does have a handy study guide that comes with all the questions that you need. Or it's great just read by yourself because it's easy and fun to read and it challenges you to go deeper on your own and develop some better habits about reading your Bible. And those benefits are both for you and for others when you talk to them about God's Word. Now, let's get back to that statement that almost got me in trouble here at the beginning. Never read a Bible verse. So I bet many of you already know where I'm going here. And what I'm really saying is that we should never read a Bible verse in isolation. Context matters. And we've probably all heard before that context matters. Well, let me give some examples. So let's play that same game that the kids were playing earlier. I'm going to read you some, uh, some verses, and you see if you can spot which of the choices is not in the Bible. Don't shout out your answers. Just silently choose which one you think doesn't belong, and then I'll reveal the answer. All right, warning up front, some of the actual verses from the Bible that I'll read can be a bit shocking and difficult to digest in isolation like this. So the challenge we should all accept when we read these verses is to dig into the context and then trust in the love and wisdom of a God who saves. All right, so let's start with this first one right here. It says, When a man sells his daughter as a slave, she shall not go out as the male slaves do. All right, next one here. For the Lord helps those who help themselves. All right, next. And it says... I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Okay, so you got uh, choices one, two, three, or four. Uh, what do we think it is? Yeah, but how many times have you heard number two uh, quoted before as being from the Bible? All right, yeah, so you can see the actual verses there. Uh, yeah, the Lord helps those who help themselves in pursuing righteousness. Uh, that is not in the Bible. All right, so you can just leave that one up there uh, and take a look at those while I pull up the next one. Got some really good ones here this morning. 
All right. Let's go with here. You shall eat the flesh of your sons, and you shall eat the flesh of your daughters. All right. Next. Blessed shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. Next. I will make my arrows drunk with blood, and my sword shall devour flesh. Okay. And one more for us to choose from. God is faithful, and he will never give you beyond your ability, but he will provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. All right, those are the four. Any thoughts? One, two, three, or four? Three. Well, we said three, four, three. All right, and the answer is, it was four. And God is faithful. He will never give you more than you can bear. Often misquoted, so I'll read what it says here. It says, no temptation has, over, has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he'll provide the way of escape. All right, next one. These are getting a little bit harder. Right, so what I learned is that our presentation software doesn't do animations. I was just going to like click through, through these and read them to you instead of having to search them all out in the Bible. But hey, I'm, I'm getting some good practice here this morning with you. Thank you for your patience. Okay, this one says, you shall not wear cloth of wool and linen mixed together. All right, and let's go back to the other side. Going over to New Testament, or am I? All right, this one says, For money is the root of all kinds of evil, is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. This one says, And the pig, because it parts the hoof and is cloven-footed but does not chew the cud, it is unclean to you. You shall not eat any of their flesh, and you shall not touch their carcasses. They are unclean to you. And the unicorn shall fall with them. <laughs> and young steers with the mighty bulls. Okay, so those are your choices, uh, one through four. Uh, any uh, thoughts? Four? Did I hear a two? Anything else? Okay, the answer is, you might be surprised. So we said money is the root of all kinds of evil. What does it actually say? The love of money. It's a little bit different, but I think it makes a difference here. Uh, and if for anyone who's wearing a, you know, maybe a poly cotton uh, blend shirt today, and number one is just not for you. It's a good thing we don't have to take these in isolation, especially, you know, Sunday afternoon if you want to go have a pulled pork sandwich and throw the football around. Uh, Leviticus 11 doesn't work for you either. And I'm not kidding. Pull up your King James Version. Oh, that's... Yes. <laughs> gotcha. Does not say that. All right. One more. And might be a little bit harder. All right. Okay, so it says, For your ways are in full view of the Lord, yet the Lord, wait, Lord works in mysterious ways. Okay, next. Then Saul said, Thus shall you say to David, The king desires no bride price except a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. How about this one? Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. And one more. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Okay, those are your four choices. All right, any thoughts this time? One, any other uh, votes? All right, that was kind of an easy one there at the end. So, yeah, uh, that first half... Of, I kind of cherry-picked from the Psalms, but the Lord works in mysterious ways I just made up. I think I've heard someone say that before. Uh, yeah, and the B and C there are both out of 1 Samuel, and uh, the, the Bible says straight up, do not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. So you know, well, I want to watch out for that. Okay, now, did you see some trends there in the verses that we just saw? Uh I kind of put some in there, and some just kind of came out as I was putting them together. But does this sometimes seem like the Old Testament reads differently than the New Testament? Now, 
That's a whole other sermon for another time, but I'll just say this for now. We shouldn't be surprised that books written by different authors, centuries apart, in vastly different cultures, don't read quite the same. It is still all the same Bible, and although all Scripture is inspired by God, the Lord still uses humans to reveal His Word and to record it. And then we'll get into later how the Old Testament is just you know, Jesus Christ concealed, and the New Testament is Jesus Christ revealed. We also don't have enough time this morning to d- dig into the context of all those verses, even though some of them were pretty troublesome. But uh, let's take comfort right now that we are not the only ones throughout history to read these verses and be uncomfortable. More on that later. One more thought before we move on about this. And I'll just kind of leave this hanging and move on. We are not the audience of the authors of the Bible. We're not. In other words, the Bible was certainly written for us, but it was not written to us. All right, moving on. It should be obvious by now that there are some real hazards associated with just cherry-picking Bible verses without considering the context. Think about the problems that this has caused and continues to cause today and over the generations. So one of the things that pops up uh, that makes us really uncomfortable is criticism of the Bible's validity. And what happens with that is we end up with all these memes. You know, we talked about, hey, there are unicorns in the Bible. They are mentioned nine times, and cats are mentioned zero times. And that's all you need to read about the Bible. And so that's pretty funny. Uh, But we also end up with memes like this next one. And these are the same verses that I read to you earlier. And we end up with memes like this, and they can very easily become criticisms of the Bible's validity. Now, thankful, as a church... A couple of years ago, we went, we dug deep into the context of this together and to be able to dig out what the Bible is saying instead of just taking these verses in isolation. We were able to grow through that and move on uh, and super thankful for that. And then uh, I'm so glad that we don't find billboards like this uh, as we're driving down the road, usually a little bit more uh, encouraging than that. Now, how else can uh, cherry picking get us into trouble? How about politics? Oof. That is also a whole other sermon. So let's just say this. Our understanding of God's word and his truth should be strong enough to shape where we stand on issues, not the other way around. We should never approach God's word looking to support political opinions, whether they are our own or come from a group that we associate with. We submit to the word. The word never submits to us. Let's open our Bibles together right now to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. So just go to the Gospel of John, and we'll read that together. Nice and warmed up here, flipping through the Bible. So go to the Gospel of John in the New Testament. All right, it says, In the beginning was the Word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Now, I know we've had some fun here this morning already, but I hope it's also clear that we take God's word very seriously, and we treat it with reverence. So it should never become a tool to support our own agendas. So where else can cherry picking get us uh, in trouble? How about relationships? So it'd be really easy for me to use God's word as a weapon against my own kids and just tell them to honor your mother and father and then just act however I want and then completely forget where it says later, for fathers, do not exasperate your children. And you can probably guess how well it would go for me if Sherry and I were in an argument which never happens. But, you know, I decided to just cherry pick Ephesians 5.22 or double down and go with Colossians 3.18 and just demand that my wife submit in everything to her husband and everything. Yeah, right. So when Sherry and I were uh, preparing for our wedding ceremony back in 2006, uh, she had some great uh, scriptures p- picked out for us. And... Colossians 3, 12 through 17 
uh, was one of the ones that she picked as one of the scripture readings, which is excellent. You know, verse 17 there at the bottom ends with, and whatever you do, whether in word and deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And when we were putting the programs together and then sending these verses to our friends who were going to read them in the ceremony, I may have changed it to Colossians 3, 12 through 18, which would have ended the reading with, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as it's fitting in the Lord. And I totally left out verse 19 that speaks to husbands right afterwards. I thought I was so funny. But thankfully... Sherry and her mom are the kind of people who love God's word and also kind of people to proofread and double check things. <laughs> so it was funny, but probably because I didn't get away with it. I don't know. It might have been funny if they would have read it that way. I don't know. Moving on. Obviously, it's a problem to cherry pick Bible verses for your own agendas, but I bet we've all done it or at least thought about it before or Maybe we've read a verse before and become troubled about what it said and what it could mean. I know that plenty of examples I put up on the screen earlier have been troublesome over the generations and still cause division in the church today. So let's just go through an example together of digging into the context of a difficult verse. So let's tackle one of those really crazy ones in case you're still squirming about it from earlier. Psalm 137.9. So there's this uh, great website that I often go to when I need help like this. Gotquestions.org is an excellent resource and probably has a response to most of the questions you've ever wondered when reading the Bible. Now, disclaimer here, this is just one resource and it's certainly not the authority on all biblical matters. However, they take a wide look at scripture as a whole and the context to go with it. So go check it out. But you might find yourself just uh, going down rabbit holes and going on tangents for hours on some really interesting stuff. Anyhow, I'll summarize the explanation that they give on their site. Now, I know I've mentioned it plenty of times on the stage here before, but the psalmists truly aren't afraid of keeping it real with their emotions. So to be clear, Psalm 137 is not God speaking and telling anybody to hurt infants. The speaker is actually a Jew exiled in Babylon who is in a really bad spot and remembering how terrible it was for the Jews when Jerusalem was destroyed and the Jews were carried off into exile. This psalm is a lament as well as a cry for revenge and a plea for God to bring their enemies to justice. So while the psalmist is quite extreme with the language and imagery used in this cry for justice, I think we can all relate to a time when we felt wronged and wish for others to be brought to justice. Now, we can appreciate that the Bible doesn't sugarcoat things for us, and we get to see the real feelings of God's children. We can also be thankful that God's word has plenty more to say about vengeance and relating to one's enemies. I bet you're already thinking about it right now. So if we go over to Romans 12, 17 through 19, it calls back to Deuteronomy 32. It says, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. That's just one example of how cherry-picking a Bible verse can lead to making the wrong conclusions, yet taking the time to understand the context makes all the difference. Therefore, we should all be careful to never read a Bible verse. Instead, we should always dig deeper to understand the context in light of all that God has said. So at least the other claim that I made here at the beginning. The Bible is not a book. The better way to describe it is that it's a library. Even though we, we can carry it around and bound in a single volume, we're actually carrying a whole library of 66 books, just like the kids told us uh, earlier. It's 66 books with over 40 authors, yet only one author. It's written in three languages in a time span of over 1,500 years. It is definitely not just a book. It's a library. So beyond all that being impressive, why is it important? 
Because we shouldn't pick up the Bible ever expecting it to read like any single book that we've ever read before. And it, you know, it's not just a book of history or laws or prophecies or poetry or encouragement or good news or how-tos or instructions, etc. The library has all of that and more. Now, next, it's important that we have a broad understanding of the whole library in order to recognize the overarching themes and how they relate to each other. And this helps us to avoid getting bogged down in troublesome topics and instead find unity in what the Bible stresses as having more importance. So is the Bible pro-slavery? Is it anti-women? Is it pro-violence? Is it anti-science? So the short answer is no. But how much division has there been in the church or society that still remains today over these same issues? Of course, these issues are complex, and they've been argued for centuries. But we must remember a couple things when we read the Bible for ourselves. And that's never read a Bible verse and consider what the whole library says about a particular issue before we conclude on that. And for my fellow technical professionals uh, here today, maybe consider it this way. When evaluating the problem for potential solutions, what proportion of scripture is dedicated to the issue compared to other issues? What is the statistical significance of your conclusion? Does the preponderance of evidence in scripture clearly define the solution, or do conflicts remain that require further investigation? Is a pattern of emphasis found in analysis of the text, or does an absence of repetition suggest a higher probability of misinterpretation? So I'm kind of, I'm kind of having fun here with my engineering speak, trying to use big words. But all I'm really saying is although we never disregard anything from God's word, we must consult the whole library before concluding on a single verse or a passage. We might be surprised at uh, what we come up with. So one more thing about the library. And we already touched on this with the kids earlier too. The whole Bible, whether deep in the Old Testament or completely overt in the New Testament, points to Jesus. And from start to finish, the Sunday school answer always applies. It's all about Jesus. And that sounds a bit elementary, but it helps us to remember a bigger story is going on behind the scenes. So in other words, we remember the importance of Jesus' backstory in the OT while getting on board with the mission that he gave us in the New Testament. So with these truths in mind, let me suggest to my fellow nerds out there another way to not read the Bible. If it's all about Jesus and the good news, then maybe start reading the Bible where it introduces a new hope. Now, definitely don't start at the beginning because you know it starts out exciting, and but after a while you might find yourself quickly getting bored and then going off on tangents about ancient characters and politics. Now, certainly don't start at the end either because that's where it gets kind of weird and it leaves you with more questions than answers. So for anyone who needs a good place to jump into reading the Bible for themselves, let's just go with the Sunday school answer by focusing on Jesus. I don't know where that slide came from. Okay, so indeed, many people believe that Matthew kicks off the New Testament and is the first gospel because it's the best gospel for teaching the New Testament and for introducing new believers to Jesus. So like Bear also mentioned last Sunday, let's all consider a Bible reading plan that's a bit more intentional than simply going cover to cover. Well, that is a lot to consider and to remember. Plus, it can be easy to get discouraged when parts of the Bible get challenged, whether it's by others or even by ourselves sometimes. So even with a deep devotion to God and the library that he's given us, we are still prone to doubt at times. This is when we must understand how not to read the Bible when searching for answers. If you are or have ever struggled like this, I know I have, even this week. Let me give you some encouragement right now. So we pulled up some of the more troubling verses here today, and we don't have time to really dig into the context to, to soothe ourselves. Just remember that people like you and me have struggled with these verses 
for centuries. Yet, the word of God remains, and the church remains. Jesus even promised that the gates of hell would not overcome the church he was building. It says that exactly in Matthew 16. So it's okay to struggle with doubt, but don't stop there. Continue to dig in, especially with others. Don't just take my word for it today. Read it for yourself and dig in deep with centuries worth of resources literally available at your fingertips. We are not alone. So seek out different perspectives than your own. Remember that the interpretation and the understanding of Scripture goes far beyond our own personal context, culture, and traditions. God's Word is so much bigger than that. So don't be content with just one quick and easy explanation when you come to a difficult passage or issue, especially if it's controversial, and especially if that answer comes from your own traditions or context. Now, we should be open. We should be open to how Scripture is interpreted on the other side of the world, or maybe even the other side of the street. So let us all have humility as we seek to know God's Word better, and then never assume that we have a monopoly on truth. And truly, the beauty of this process is that we all have the same helper to guide us to the truth. If we submit to him, and we're laying, willing to lay down our preferences and desires. So have faith. Have faith. Pray and seek the Lord and his word. And if you still continue to struggle with your faith after that, you continue to struggle with parts of the Bible, try to think of it this way. So Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, he knew and read and believed his Bible. Now, his Bible was just the Old Testament, and it was probably arranged a little bit differently than ours, but he gave us a model of the power and the joy that comes from knowing God's word. And so he even took the time to open the minds of the disciples to show all of Scripture pointed to him. So let's jump into that story together. It's in Luke 24. So let's open up to Luke 24, over to verse 30 to begin. Now the context here is that this is after the resurrection, and he had appeared to some of his disciples on the road to Emmaus. And then he uh, reveals himself again to everybody when they were all together. Now this is one of my favorite stories from the Gospels, and I can only guess how much the Lord might have enjoyed appearing to the disciples at that moment, being able to see his friends and the, the reaction that came. Scripture doesn't really give us too much in there, but we'll read it here in a second. This story also gives me hope that he had a great sense of humor. So let's pick up the story in verse 30. So when he was at table with them, the two disciples that he was on the road with, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, and those who were with him gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. And as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, for that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. 
He opened their minds to understand the scriptures. My prayer today is that he would do the same for us as we learn how to read the Bible and how not to read the Bible. So remember, the Bible isn't a book. It's a rich library, and it's all about Jesus. And never read a Bible verse.